if I had it to do all over again, knowing that I would never get out, I would rather have been executed. You need to remember the good things outside. They're always on your mind. Every time you think of something you, or hear something on the air, you remember, well, what was I doing back then out in the free world? There's no words, uh, no description that will, uh, nothing that will say, uh, that can compensate for one's freedom. I mean, if a man had a million dollars, like if I had a million dollars today, I'd give a million dollars to be free. I mean, a million dollars wouldn't mean anything to me and him. So, uh, that's to give you a fair idea of what being in the penitentiary means, you know. Life at Stateville. The Wasted Years. Narrator, Hugh Hill. This is Hugh Hill at the gates of Stateville Prison. You are about to see an accurate account of what life is really like inside a large penitentiary. The accepted view is false. In this jail, there are no big shots, no tough guys, only pitiable human beings doing time in one of the toughest institutions in the world. It is not our intent to disguise the purpose for their incarceration. The men who are in these institutions were convicted of crimes ranging anywhere from burglary to murder. Some have spent 20 to 30 years of their lives behind the wall. You will hear their story as told by the inmates themselves. And if this account of life at Stateville deters one youngster from wasting his years the same way, the result will be worth the effort. New prisoners arrive by bus almost every day. They call the new inmates at Stateville fish. They're entering a maximum security prison built for half the present population of 5,221. Their first look at Stateville disguises the true purpose. It's a camouflage of clean buildings, beautiful grounds, small groups of prisoners with apparent freedom of movement. As the Chicago sociologist puts it, this is an institution that has its nose wiped, its shoes shined, and its tie straight. But except for the physical improvements, imprisonment at Stateville is the same unrelenting shackling of the spirit that it has been since the beginning of time. There are about 210,000 inmates in the United States doing time in 230 state and federal penitentiaries. Stateville, because of the nature of its population, is one of the toughest. It is the only prison in the nation that has round cell houses. The rules here are strict, the routine rigid. The convicts become institutionalized more rapidly because the pressure is never off. We begin our story of what it means to do time at Stateville Prison at 7 a.m. in cell house D. Two, five, seven, eight, nine. All prisoners must stand at their cell doors for the morning count seven, check. The two officers four, walk eight, by and count flesh. Here's prisoner 199E describing the morning routine. First thing you do when you get up in the morning. Six, twenty-seven. <laughs> Usually wash up, clean up, 31, sit there and wait for the count bell. When the count is checked, 36, put your coat on and cap and get ready to go to work. Uh, 40, 40, that's all you have to look forward to. 46, I mean, what else have you got uh, with my kind of a sentence? Uh, what else is there to look forward to? 11, I mean, uh, 14, 16, actually, uh, 16, I get up and says it's the same thing. It's the same routine day after day. On one gallery, 123. 123, right. On two gallery, 162. 162, right. On three gallery, 183. 183, right. Four gallery, 168. 168, right. Try 
life at Stateville is made up of a series of movements, the same each day, timed almost to the second. A constant shuffling of prisoners from one place to another, to breakfast where this group is going, to school or work assignments, back to lunch, into the cells. And during all that marching, the no talking rule is strictly enforced. This prisoner knows that in the penitentiary, you must live by the rules. There is no escape because there are always ways of making you obey them. Paul Jencott has been in Stateville for 25 years, sentenced to 199 years for murder, plus two life sentences under the Habitual Criminal Act. He has learned that this is a world of can't. That's right, you can. You cannot uh, eat with whom you please. You cannot see the movie you please. You see one movie a week, whether you like it or not. Uh, you cannot go to the yard when you please. You go to the yard when they tell you to go to the yard, and you come in when they tell you to come in. Uh, you march in uh, for, uh, cell, cell formation on the gallery. You cannot skip a cell or fall back a cell. Uh, you cannot go to church when you please. You go to church on one specified day a week or on holy days of obligation. Uh, you cannot go swimming because we have no swimming pool. You cannot go fishing because uh, we have no stream here. Uh, you cannot go to the ball game because in the wintertime we don't have ball games. We have the movie. In the, likewise, in the summertime, you cannot go to the movie because you have a ball game on a Saturday. So everything is can't. You can't uh, whistle in the cell. You can't shout in the cell. You can't talk loud in the cell. Uh, you can't eat what you want to eat because you eat what they serve. If you uh, pass something, you just passed it. That's all there's to it. Warden Frank Pate came up through the ranks of guards to succeed the famous Joseph Reagan, now the Illinois Director of Public Safety. Warden Pate carries out Reagan's philosophy of strict discipline to ensure order at a maximum security institution. Warden Pate, why must Stateville Prison be so secure? Why does it have to be so tight, as they say down here? Because we're equipped to receive the uh, long-timer, the uh, troublemaker and the repeater. And by long time, I mean a man with an extensive sentence. Uh, we have uh, over 700 men with sentences of life or even more confined in this area. Now, that doesn't mean to say that every man with lengthy sentence is a troublemaker or particularly vicious, but we do have some dangerous and vicious people here. However, I think they're in a minority. But uh, we have some who would take uh, any means at hand to uh, uh, leave us, to escape the place. I can show you what I mean over here. Well, that's quite a sample case you have, Warden. Yes, this is contraband that we've uh, uh, picked up in searches here over a number of years and put together for the purpose of instructing student officers. Uh, gives them some idea of what these men can uh, develop. Uh, <clears throat> here's a spoon, just a simple uh, spoon with the uh, end of it sharpened. A knife fashion out of that. How do they sharpen it? By uh, pointing it on the concrete, which we have. Uh, just rubbing so it on the concrete? That's right, yes, sir. Here's uh, another spoon with a, a key fashion out of it that uh, work one of the, the doors. Is that a good key? It's a good key. It would work. Uh, here's a... Another knife or dagger made from uh, simply rolling up a tobacco tin and wetting it, the end of it on the, the concrete. Here's a very simple but a very dangerous weapon made from a brace of a bed. And here again, individual home, this sharp edge on the concrete. Took some time. Of course, uh, we know that a bar can be cut uh, with various things if given enough time. Emery dust and string, for example. The warden of Stateville has an effective means of punishment to handle what he calls the non-conformist. It's called isolation, Stateville's version of solitary confinement. It has changed very little over the years, except that now the maximum time in isolation is 15 days. An officer checks each cell every 20 minutes. The inmate leaves everything behind when he enters the cell. He has nothing to do for 24 hours a day but sit, stand, or lay down, sleep, or think.
All right, hold it up. All right, right in. Close the door behind you. You find out tomorrow when the captain interviews you. I have meat yet. When do I eat? Well, you'll eat tomorrow. We only feed once a day here. It's, uh, there's nothing good about it. It's very bad. Well, you just try to imagine sleeping on three tissue paper thin blankets. You got a commode in there, tap water. Nothing else. One meal a day, and that one meal consists of, I don't know, I say about uh, two ounces of beans or whatever they have on the main line, one slice of, a slice of bread, and on Sundays you may get a ration of meat. And that goes on for, fifth, that can go on for 15 days. No clothing? Yes, you have clothing in there. You have a jacket and a pair of trousers. You sleep on the floor? Sleep on the floor. And if you decide to do something about it, such as bugging up, creating a lot of noise, after you come out, if the officials deem fit, they can put you in segregation. That happened to me. The inmate in segregation is completely isolated from the rest of the prison population. He is alone in his cell, and even when he is led to a small courtyard for recreation, he is alone. That half hour in the yard is the only time that he is allowed out of his cell during a 24-hour period. The average stay in segregation is three to four months. But one man stayed there for 14 years, another for 11. In past years, segregation was a trouble spot. The prisoners would break up the toilets and beds and throw the pieces at guards. So now the beds are bolted to the concrete floor and the toilets are made of metal. They get three meals a day and books to read. But they must stay in the cells all day, every day. But not all the prisoners get into trouble. Some conform to the rules immediately. This man did. Prison here, uh, you didn't have much of an education? Not in English. Couldn't speak English? Well, while I worked in Chicago, I picked up a few words. I worked Jesse Gonzalez has been a model prisoner since the day he entered Stateville five years ago. If he had not conformed to the rules, he would not have been allowed to start grade school and go on to Stateville High School. Yes, I went to grade school. I started in the first grade. And it took me 18 months to graduate. And then I went to high school. There are 150 inmates in the high school and 200 in grammar school. The name of the school does not appear on the diploma. There are 46 in the TV Junior College, and 800 men are taking correspondence courses from Stateville High. All the instructors are inmates. Like Gonzalez, some of the students couldn't speak English when they entered prison. They learn in this class. So when you see that word there, how would it read? Feet. 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 And uh, how would that read? Need. Need. So then we're going to the uh, double O. That has the U sound. Tiene el sonido U de español. Cada vez que vean estas dos letras juntas, tiene este sonido. Dame una palabra con el sonido este, double O. Food. Food. Book. Book. So, es todo lo que tienen que recordar de esta regla. No tienen ninguna pregunta, ninguno de ustedes. Any questions? Everybody understand that, huh? All right. 
Warden Pate says he wouldn't know what to do if it weren't for the schools at Stateville. It's not only a way to educate the ignorant, but it is another method of keeping the inmates busy. And that's a major task at Stateville Prison. Pate says, I know that when we teach a man to read and write, he may go out and hang some paper, and forgery would bring him back here. This mathematics teacher, by the way, is a physician. Many of the inmate students get good grades in school. They have plenty of time to study. There are also some excellent artists in Stateville. They work in oils, pastels, and watercolors. The man who painted these pictures is doing 18 years for burglary and assault to rape. His work has been displayed many times on the outside. He can't offer for sale any of his paintings. Warden Pate says we teach just about everything in our schools except chemistry. But even in school, the maximum security is never relaxed. A man coming into school must be searched or frisked or shook down in the state-filled parlance. The frisking of the inmates goes on everywhere, all day long. Neither the inmates nor the guards like it, but it must be done. The inmates earn no money in school. Prisoner Gonzalez had to quit in his second year of high school. He wants to buy books in Spanish, and to get the money, he has to work in a factory. No, I'm, I'm working in a furniture factory. How much have you earned? Well, right now I got $66.25. This is uh, there on my savings. And uh, I ordered some books. That's about it. I got a $10 over with, with the commissary. That's all I have. In the tent shop, music is piped in over a loudspeaker. There's so much noise in the place that it's hard to hear. Warden Pate knows that if he teaches a man to weld, he may go out and work on a safe. But there has to be a way to train a man and at the same time keep him occupied. Prison officials call it a hot shop because a weapon can be stamped out fast. Says the warden, let's face it, they can stamp out a knife in three minutes. Many prisoners naturally want to work where they get paid the most money. They can earn an average of 12 to $14 a month. The bigger money is called long bread, the smaller amount, short bread. The inmates are issued tools when they enter the factory. They must account for all of them and turn them in when they leave. They are placed into a shadow board, silhouettes painted on the back of a tool chest. Every shadow must be covered by a tool. If a tool is missing, they might shut down the factory and call for a general shakedown. Uh, sometimes a tool isn't found, and in uh, those cases, the tool is usually destroyed where no one can use it because it's so hot that uh, no one, no man with any sensible state of mind would bring it out in the open where he could use it. You know, he uh, throws it in the sewer or something, and in a couple of instances, I have known them to uh, dig up sewers. They dug uh, B.I.S. Yard up here about five years ago looking for a uh, weapon, a knife. Even if a tool isn't missing, the men are searched again as they leave the factory. They must pull out everything from their pockets, take their hats off and hold them in the air, arms akimbo, while the guards go over them. The men hate it. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that sickens you. Why? I mean... Well, it's, uh, it's uh, because you're always going into your pockets and taking out your smoking and your handkerchief and your cup and your cigarettes and everything else that you got, and you're always hanging it out there. This is the busiest penitentiary intersection in the world. Inmates coming from schools and factories converge on this spot, make the turn, and head for the dining room. Just like in the Army, hurry up and wait. All meals are timed, and the first man in is always the first man to leave, to give the last inmate the same amount of time to eat as the first. This is probably the cleanest kitchen in the United States. It is constantly being scrubbed down before, during, and after the meals. New prisoners must take their turn in the kitchen. Chester Weger, serving a life sentence for murdering a Riverside woman in Starved Rock State Park, is still working in the kitchen. Each one of those portable tables is moved to a point on the outer rim of this circular dining room. 
The inmates go by and pick up their food from that location. Today's menu includes a slice of cheese, beans and pork, and cornbread. Beans are the most popular dish in the prison. Joseph Reagan says he has seen men pass up roast beef to get to the beans. The men must move through the chow line swiftly. They eat in shifts, 20 minutes to each shift. The dining room is the most ticklish trouble spot in the entire prison. It's the only place where so many men gather together in one place. Warden Pate says, if you run out of a favorite item, you better have something as good or better to replace it or you'll have trouble. There are three officers in the tower, armed with rifles and tear gas. Five or six years ago, there was a no talking rule strictly enforced in the dining room. Now they're allowed to talk, but only in low tones. Older convicts actually object to any talking at all during meals. One of them said, there are so many guys driving Cadillacs and chasing blondes, you can't get a decent meal. Some inmates say there's a lot of tension in the dining room. One day, a plate was dropped on the floor. The entire assemblage sat bolt upright, waiting for something to happen. Those spoons, by the way, are watched carefully by the guards. And once again, they're counted as they leave the dining room. Each guard is responsible for his group of men. He doesn't dare have one missing. The dining room is emptied swiftly to make ready for another shift. The entire population of this prison has been fed in one hour and 15 minutes. Not a scrap of food is wasted. If an inmate leaves just one slice of bread, he may have his privileges, such as listening to the radio, taken away for as much as 15 days. Some prisoners, when confronted with this type of penalty, have asked to spend three days in isolation instead. The requests are always turned down. Warden Pate says this may seem like tough punishment, but what if 5,000 prisoners left just one slice of bread? Warden Pate also says that if he could, he would like to see many changes in maximum security type of imprisonment in this state. What I would like to see in uh, <clears throat> this state is more institutions not the maximum security type. I think our state has enough maximum security prisons to last for 100 years. What I have reference to is minimum security institution, minimum custody, open type institutions. We have many men here at Statesville that don't need all this custody. Uh, they could be handled very easily in a minimum security institution. Fortunately, Illinois is getting a new institution in the southern part of the state for this type of individual. One, four. This is the 13th seven, count of the day. There will be three more during the night. 18, the Catholic 17, chaplain, Father Gervais Brinkman, says the following 23, 14 hours, that's the toughest part of doing time. Here's how an inmate describes it. It's a cell time in the wintertime because, like they say, you got to be in the cell from sundown to sun, sun up. Winters are long and rough? Always. Six, 60, 60. You just... Three. I don't know. Uh, some guys might say, well, it's a snap. Well, it's not. You won't ever get out, would you? Well, I got a chance to see the board in 33 years. 30. You think about it? All the time. 32. Can't help think about it. 33. What year will that be? That'll be 1983. I'll see the board. 133. Right. Lock them. After the guard locks the cells with the key, a second lock is turned from the guard tower by a hydraulic switch, and it's crowded in there, three men in each cell. They have plenty of time to think. Almost every night. You think about your relatives after you, for so long after you're here, and they soon drop off, stop writing to you, stop coming to see you. 
And that's where it really hurts. When your relative doesn't come down. Your kids, you don't know them. Mine today, I hardly know. In fact, they are strangers to me, just like you are. My daughter, if I saw her today, I wouldn't know her. You're deprived of everything, you know, all of a sudden. You know, everyone that you love or think anything about at all is uh, away from you. You can't see them in certain days. You know, nights you dream about them. You wake up. Well, it's, I guess uh, you cry a little bit and everything else. You know, you're miserable uh, beyond uh, description. Yeah, I've, I've looked at the wall. Uh, I sit in my, in my, sit in my cell many times and look at the wall. I can see trees that has grown up that extends perhaps up above the wall, you know. And I'm only a few feet away, but yet, as far as freedom is concerned, I'm at the end of the world. It, it is hideous. It is, it is hideous. I mean, it's, it's no description for it. I mean, it's no, it's no description for it. All your social life is gone. You, uh, little things that you uh, wouldn't ordinarily notice on the street here is uh, obviously absent, you know? Like, like uh, well, for instance, like seeing children and uh, hearing the voice of women and uh, being able to uh, step out when you want to, go to bed when you want to, eat what you want to, you know, when you want to. <clears throat> and uh, there's so many things that that it would take hours to describe. Stateville Prison is a strange, almost inbred institution. It's a world set apart. It even has its own language. And it has a separate set of mores. We have declined the temptation to include a description of that part of prison life, the fears and the hatreds. One former inmate actually told me that this place is a hate factory. We have passed over the story of the prison underground, although even the warden admits that one exists. We have foregone an account of the informers, although there are some here. Joseph Reagan was once quoted as saying, if three men are talking in the yard, two of them are mine. He probably never said it, but many of the inmates here believe that he said it and meant it. There are probably some ex-convicts who are watching who would disagree with our portrayal of life in Stateville. But to this reporter, it seemed that the real punishment here adds up to one thing and one thing only, the finality and completeness of the regimentation, the separation from the insignificant pleasures and freedoms of the outside world. That punishment is what turns the days, the nights, and the months into the wasted years. Life at Stateville, the wasted years. Now, a WBBM-TV editorial expressing the views of this station's management. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice President of the Columbia Television Stations Division and General Manager of WBBM-TV, Mr. Clark B. George. Good evening. I would like to have you see and hear three Stateville prisoners. I urge you to listen carefully. Two of these men are brothers. One has been paroled, the other is due for parole this week. But the important point is that they went to prison together for armed robbery and murder and spent 10 years of their lives in confinement. The third man was sentenced to 99 years for murder. 
He has already spent 12 years of his life at Stateville and is not even eligible to ask for parole for another 21 years. Listen. My father, although he was anxious for us kids to get an education and he would kick us out of the house and send us to school, uh, he didn't see that we stayed there. Consequently, why no interest from home, why those kids would play hooky five out of six days, or better than that even. I'd say we played hooky 90% of the time. After you came back out of the Army in 1946, what happened then? Well, I went out stealing again, just running around. Once in a while, I'd get a job to make my mom feel a little better, but other than that, I'd be out of steel all the time and it didn't work. You never worked? No, not what you'd call work, no. No education, so you didn't know what to do? Couldn't get a good job. Where are you going to get a job? Who's going to hire you? And the kind of work I know, nobody wants it. They won't employ it. Uneducated the way I was, uh, I, didn't know, I, I didn't understand other people, you know. And uh, really, I didn't even understand myself. And uh, I, I looked at everybody else as my enemy. And uh, of course, I think that was partially caused too by living through the depression, you know, as a kid. And uh, especially the, uh, the law officials, prison officials, I thought they were all, and even the taxpayers after I come to prison, I thought they were all my enemies. Because I figured their taxes was the ones that supporting this prison and paying the officials to keep me here, you know. We would go out at night to uh, Douglas Park and Jefferson Park and uh, for the, just for fun, we would roll bombs for cigarettes. That was mainly what we would do. Uh, just for the kick of it, we'd roll a bomb for a pack of cigarettes and uh, we thought it was something big. We never got over a pack of cigarettes. Seldom we got a half a pack. But it was, there was some thrill to it. We had taken something. You graduated from that? We graduated from that uh, two lead pipes. We'd uh, knock a man in the head for a half pack of cigarettes. Well, to be honest with you, I've, I've done that a lot of thinking. And I believe that had I listened, instead of thought I knew it all, I wouldn't be here. Because if I'd have listened to what my mom told me years ago, it would have never happened. I mean, if you'd have stayed in school? Stayed in school and uh, just quit running with the gangs. These studies this, uh, changed my whole attitude towards everything. I know that if I'd went to school and uh, the way I have here on the street, that I would have never come to prison. Now you're getting out after 10 years. After 10 years. What have you got to go to on the outside? Well, I have nothing now. Uh, it was 10 years in the past. I didn't have anything when I come to prison, actually. And uh, now that 10 years has passed in between, well, there's even less. I had two children when I come in. One of them was 18 months old, one was three years old. And uh, they're practically grown now and don't even know me. And uh, of course, I've got a wonderful family that's going to try to do everything they can to try to help me make the grade. And I'm certainly going to do what I can. And, uh, I don't think that. Uh, State will ever have anything, any more trouble out of me. <laughs> I'm sure you will agree that the scenes you have just witnessed were dismal and depressing. Probably nothing in a man's experience in a free society can equal in tragedy the loss of his personal freedom, his friends, his home, his family. Yet, there are literally hundreds of young people in Chicago today who will face this loss of freedom if they continue to travel the paths that they are currently following. And one of these paths leading to tragedy begins when a young man or woman drops out of school. Dr. James B. Conant, former president of Harvard University, has said, although the causes of juvenile delinquency are complex and there is no one solution, employment opportunities are clearly important. A youth who has dropped out of school and has never had a full-time job is not likely to become a constructive citizen of his community. Quite the contrary, as a frustrated individual, he is likely to be antisocial and rebellious and may well become a juvenile delinquent. 
WBBM-TV has deliberately linked this editorial to a documentary on prison life to bring as forcibly as possible to parents, children, educators, and employers alike the dreadful, proven, potential social dynamite which exists today because of the problem of dropouts. Governor Kerner, in an address before the Sales Marketing Executives Club on February 13th, stated, the boy who drops out of school before finishing high school has little prospect of any job. He faces months and years of unrelieved idleness. He is made for trouble. He will become almost of necessity a costly dependent or costlier delinquent. The easiest path for the young unwanted dropouts is quite clearly charted. It runs from dependent to delinquent to adult criminal. Ladies and gentlemen, there are 5,221 prisoners at Stateville. It is estimated by prison authorities that nine out of 10 of these prisoners have never finished high school. And the future looks very dark because according to the Chicago School Board, 37% of our high school students currently drop out before graduation. And if the present trend continues, this percentage will rise to 50% in the years just ahead. Think of it, one out of every two high school students, a potential prospect for tragedy. Now there are a number of agencies and some business firms trying to do something about this mounting problem. The Drake School Project being conducted by the Public School Administration, the Double E Education Employment Program carried out by Carson Perry Scott and Company in cooperation with the public school system, and the Needle Trades Training Project, underwritten by the Ford Foundation and involving the cooperation of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, Hart Schaffner and Marx, B. Kuppenheimer and Company, and the Illinois State Employment Service, these are examples of enlightened civic and business and labor leadership. But we believe the heart of the problem lies in the family and in the young people themselves. And thus we are trying to communicate to you, parents and children alike, what terrible potential consequences can befall those young people who cannot get jobs and thus join the more than one million between 16 and 25 years of age who roam the streets of the United States today. As Chandler Brossard, senior editor, Look Magazine, says in an article in Look, February 27th, which we recommend to you, jobs in factories, stores, and even on farms that used to be open to kids with no particular training are almost disappearing. The majority of employers are extremely reluctant to hire a dropout because his lack of education makes it difficult to train him. Government, schools, business, and labor can aid in this problem. But the real solution must lie in the realization by parents and children that nothing can be any more important in the lives of young persons today than the completion of a high school education. A life of tragedy, of wasted years, can be the alternative. Thank you.